Hello, my name is Dr. Greg Mattingly. On behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity titled, Moving Beyond Better to Getting Patients Well. Tools to measure how well your patient is doing with treatment. This activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians across the globe. I am the Associate Clinical Professor at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri, and President of the Midwest Research Group in St. Charles, Missouri. Today we are going to focus on evidence-based strategies to assess treatment outcomes when you're managing depression in your clinical practice. Upon completion of this activity, you should be able to utilize measurement-based care tactics to ensure your patients are not just better, but are getting well. Measurement-based care is a critical component of patient management in every health condition. When we talk about depression, measurement-based care, using tools to measure symptoms, improves shared decision-making between you and your patients. As we go to this next slide, we'll see why is measurement-based care important? Because it starts a dialogue between you and your patient. Why is measurement-based care important? because it improves outcomes. Why is measurement-based care important? Because it'll save you time in your clinical practice. So when we talk about using a rating scale in the waiting room, your patient comes in, they fill out a rating scale, maybe at home, maybe in your waiting room. But when they walk through that door, they've already thought about their symptoms. When they walk through that door to see you, you've already got a number that tells you where your patient is. So we start a dialogue with our patients where they've thought about their symptoms. We've already looked at the number, so we have an idea of where they are and where we're heading with their treatment outcomes. As we talk about the next slide about adherence, one of the banes of our existence in all health conditions, but especially in depression and mental health, is that patients may not understand they need to stay on their medicine. Measuring symptoms has been shown over and over and over again to help patients understand the need for consistent treatment. Just similar to when you measure somebody's glucose level, their hemoglobin A1C, and you can say it's important to stay on your diabetes medicines. The same is true with mental health care. By measuring symptoms, you're able to have a discussion. It makes it real for your patient in their lives and it helps to drive home the need for ongoing consistent treatment. When we talk about clinical outcomes in major depression, measuring symptoms gives you goals of where to go. You can look and see, is my patient really severely depressed? Is my patient getting partially better? Or is my patient not just better, but getting well? Here's a slide that is one of my favorite slides in the deck. And when I first saw this slide, I thought, what kind of a mess is this? But let me walk you through what this slide is. This was the group at Harvard that was doing a genetics of depression study. And they said, we want to take a look at 20 patients who received the exact same SSRI. And let's track the individual outcomes of each of these 20 patients. And what you see is, there's a ton of scatter. Down at the bottom in purple, we see that one out of 20 people when they were put on the SSRI had an amazing response. This was the silver bullet. It's what we all hope for when we start that first treatment option. The bad news is that was only one out of 20 patients. If we look at the top in light blue, is the patients that you give them an antidepressant and really there's just no response. And we see there there's two or three, maybe four people that really an antidepressant by itself just wasn't doing very much. In the middle is what we see for the vast majority of our patients. Two thirds of our patients, when we put them on an antidepressant, what we see highlighted in red is they get partially better, but they don't get well. What's it mean in the life of a patient to be partially better? It means week by week by week. If you look at those curves, there's a lot of scatter. I'm good one week, until something stressful happens. I have a tough week at work. I break up with my girlfriend. Maybe my back starts hurting and I start having problems with chronic pain. And all of a sudden, 
partially treated depression, the patients fragment and fall apart. What does that mean in your office? What does that mean in your life? Those are the patients on an antidepressant, that they're good for a few weeks, they're good for a month, maybe a month or two, and then they fall apart. They wind up back in your waiting room. They wind up asking for a work note. They wind up having complications of their physical conditions because their overall mental health condition is only partially better. The way I teach this to my medical students and the residents, partially treated depression is just like partially treated cancer. What tends to happen over time? It comes back. So when we talk about measurement-based care, I want to simplify this. Think about the patients coming in your office. When you're treating hypertension, isn't it nice to know the number? When you're treating diabetes, isn't it nice to know patients' blood sugars, their hemoglobin A1C? Why do we like those numbers? Because it helps to guide treatment. The same is true when it comes to depression. Knowing the number is going to simplify your treatment. It's going to save you time and it's gonna make you a better doctor or nurse for your patients. So there are a number of quality measures when it comes to mental health and depression. It's now recommended that adolescents who are being seen in your practice should be measured for depression on a fairly routine basis, age 12 and over. It's considered a quality measure. It's now considered a quality measure that adults being seen in your clinical practice should be routinely screened for depression on an ongoing basis. Why? because depression is one of the top 10 health conditions in all of medicine. And it's now considered a routine part of taking care of any woman that's pregnant that they should be screened for depression. Why? Because postpartum depression can complicate conditions and nearly one in seven women will have some version of postpartum depression after delivering their child. So when we talk about teenagers, when we talk about adults, when we talk about a women that are pregnant, measurement-based care is now considered a routine part of taking care of your patients. So what are some of the benefits of measuring symptoms? Some of the benefits are, on primary benefits, we get to track outcomes. We get to see if somebody's stuck getting partially better but not all the way better. We also know that we, it helps to guide our treatment. It helps to save time in your care. I'm going to walk you through some slides that talk about the impact of how much does depression screening, depression measurement, make a difference compared to other health conditions. Secondary measures, things we tend to overlook, is screening for depression, talking about depression, sometimes bring up things that our patients didn't even know were an issue within their life. Every week, I have patients that come in and say, Dr. Mattingly, I just thought I was supposed to feel this way. Yeah. Dr. Mattingly, you know, I've got a stressful life. I just assumed everybody who had a stressful life wasn't sleeping, was having anxiety, couldn't focus at work, and would fall apart. And it wasn't until I came in and started talking about depression that I realized that my life could be different. So let's talk about the impact of screening for depression in the lives of your patients. So how do we do it? Okay, what none of us want is something more complicated. I'm busy, you're busy. When I talk to my friends in primary care, internal medicine, family medicine, they say, listen, I've got so much on my plate, I can't do another thing. The reason I like this scale, the PHQ-9, is this scale takes things off of your plate. Why does it take things off your plate? Because your patient fills this out in the waiting room or before they ever come to see you. If you have somebody who you recognize depression when you're seeing them, leave the room, give them this scale, come back in a few minutes and they can complete it. It doesn't take any time. When you look at that scale, the PHQ-9 measures the nine core symptoms of depression. There's nothing fancy about it. How's your mood? Are you able to enjoy things? Are you sleeping? How's your appetite? How's your concentration? Are you able to handle stress? Are you feeling hopeless? Have you had any thoughts of suicide? And it goes through those nine symptoms. It also gives you a number. You can track each of the individual nine symptoms, but it tells you, where's your patient overall? Is their depression severe? Hey, I need to give this patient 
higher attention. Maybe refer them to a counselor, maybe get them into a mental health clinic, or maybe see them back a little more frequent because their depression is pretty bad. It gives you a number where maybe they're moderate. You know, that's where most of your patients are going to be. And then for the topic of today, not just stuck with moderate depression, partially treated depression, but have I gotten them all the way better? So when we look at numbers, if we look at this patient, they come in, you see there's a number of things hanging out there on the far right-hand side. They have, I think, three symptoms that are hitting them pretty much every day. They have a number of symptoms that are hitting them several times a week. And they have a few symptoms that are hitting them once in a while during the week. If you look at the overall number, this patient is in that moderate level of depression, so they're not a train wreck, but they're not functioning very well. Here's some of our anchors. So when you get the PHQ-9, here's something you should probably photocopy and just keep somewhere in your office till you're really used to it. When I get the PHQ-9, when my nurse puts it in the chart, when my office assistant puts it in the chart, how do I interpret it? Not only do I look at the individual symptoms, just scan them quickly to see what's going on, but if you look over there at the overall level of symptoms, if somebody's in the upper teens to 20s, you've got to pay attention to them. These are pretty depressed people. They warrant extra levels of care. If they're in the low teens to mid teens, that's your moderate depression. Maybe they're doing better. Maybe they're on their SSRI as we saw in the Harvard study, but they're still bouncing around, not really all the way well. I'm better one week till I get stressed, then I fall apart again. That will be the vast majority of people you see in your clinical practice. The goal is to get them to those scores that are less than 10. I want to get those items less than 10 so that your symptoms are back to normal or mild on average. So let's take a look at visit two. Visit two, our patient comes back. We see that symptoms have shifted. We put them on an antidepressant. They're doing somewhat better. But if we measure the symptoms, we still see there's a handful of symptoms. If I look at this scale, one, two, three, four, five, five symptoms that are still hanging out there where they're occurring for your patients. So the patient's doing better. They're better, but still not well. So let's think about this patient. Let's query this patient and say, What's not back to where it should be? To give us some tools about where we want to go next as far as treatment. So step one, identify the targets. Use the rating scale. Use it on a routine basis to screen for depression in your clinical practice. Number two, look at some of the best measures in your office, best practices. How often am I going to use this? Maybe once a year is a routine measure for patients coming in my practice. Maybe teenagers once a year. Maybe every woman during her pregnancy, I'm going to screen her at least once, which are the current recommendations for depression. As we go on down through implementing these screens, it's learning how to use them in the same way you've learned how to use a hypertension, a blood pressure measure, to effectively treat your patients and deliver better care within their lives. So let me close with what we now call SMART goals. SMART goals when it comes to depression is getting somebody not just partially better, but all the way better. The SMART goals are measuring symptoms in the same way we would any other health condition to save time, to improve outcomes, and to make sure we don't leave our patients partially better, but not all the way better. I'd like to challenge each of you to think about depression the way you do other health conditions. You see it every day. You're on the forefront of taking care of it. Don't leave somebody partially better. Try to get them all the way well. So thank you for joining us on today's medical education activity.